Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Pro Series Podcast. This is episode 60, and today's guest is Nitin Golvia. Nitin is the Chief Sales and Marketing Officer and the Senior Vice President of the Asian Pacific Sector of Surge Ferrari. Surge Ferrari is a textile company that is international. We get to go over all things international business about different language barriers or cultural barriers in business. He goes over all of that. Um, that's something I've never gone over in this podcast, so I'm very excited for everybody to hear this. Um, but before we get into this podcast, please make sure you like, subscribe, and review this podcast on wherever you listen to podcasts. But now I hope you enjoy episode 60 with Nitin Golvia. Thank you so much, Nitin, for sitting down with me today and talking on the Pro Series podcast. Excited to talk to you about your company and your experience. Thank you, Eric. Thank you for inviting me over and um, great to be with you here. Yes. And I always like to start every podcast off with how we got to um, find each other. And I want to thank uh, your coworker, Jill, for emailing me to, um, about your company. I mean, I think it's great to really, I've never had a product like yours on the podcast. So it's very exciting to learn more about it. So I want to start off and just, can you tell me about your company, Surge Ferrari? Um, and then we'll get into your background. Okay. Thank you, Eric. Um, and thanks for uh, having us over. I hope um, based on what I'm going to say about our company and product could be interesting for the audiences. Right. So I work for a company, French company called Surge Ferrari. It's a French company. So we will be completing 50 years in 2023. So it's been a long time uh, in awesome. this industry. Uh, we are in the business, as we say, of manufacturing material called composite material, or in some countries, it may be called technical fabrics or membranes, uh, depending on whatever uh, nomenclature a country may use. So what it means is we are making fabrics, which is cutting across multiple market segments or applications. So fabrics, which could be used for blinds, awnings, acoustics, uh, could be used for big structures, what we call as tensile structures like airports, stadiums, railway stations, walkways, shade uh, shade structures. Uh, we also have um, uh, products for facades, which are second skin facades, which can be used as permanent permanent uh, fixings outside a building or enveloping a building. Uh, then we have products for marine uh, equipment protection or marine uh, 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 furniture which you use in yachts and other uh, cruise liners and furniture which is for um, outdoor furniture or could be used you can use those uh, elements on the indoor furniture so these are our primarily and then we have fabrics which you use for event tents you know temporary tents high-end event tents or making pergolas uh, those kinds of applications or temporary warehouses and then on the industrial side we also have um, fabrics which can be used to make fish cage uh, and also uh, biogas installations, the domes of biogas, where you can process the waste and the manure to convert it into either gas or electricity, depending on the type of country. So we have multiple products for multiple applications. And interestingly enough, we are the only company which is operates transversally. Um, mm -hmm. So the, it makes it interesting, but also challenging because while you know that you have multiple market segments to uh, target at and look at. But at the same time, we face competition which are uniquely present in only one of those segments. So we will have companies which are only focusing on fabrics for blinds. Some other companies focuses on fabric only for furniture. So that makes it um, challenging also because then their whole energy is on that market segment. But then uh, that's the interesting part of, uh, of this journey and working with this company. That's awesome. So what's your um, job in this in your success of Surge Ferrari? Yeah, so uh, just to add to the previous point. So uh, uh, being a French company, most of our manufacturing is done in France. And uh, recently we acquired a few years back a company in Germany and also in Taiwan. So uh, but majority of our products come from France and uh, Germany. Um, my role is um, is a general management role. Uh, in fact, I'm wearing uh, multiple hats or I would say two main hats in that sense. One is on the business side where I geographically manage uh, the business on Asia Pacific, Middle East and Africa. 
So okay. it's a big uh, region, you know, in terms of, uh, I mean, even in landmass, but more in terms of population. Um, and um, and I report directly to the CEO. And on the other side, um, out of the four strategic markets, as I mentioned, I'm also globally responsible for tensile architecture, modular and industry uh, markets, which are uh, in a more of a product and a marketing role globally. So, mm-hmm. so, uh, so that's, that's, uh, those are two hats I, I wear. And, um, and it obviously, because of the role I have, it also means I'm traveling a lot. I'm based out of Singapore. I've been here for the last 15 years, uh, but uh, traveling across the region, I mean, starting from Africa to North Asia, to Oceania, and all the Asian countries, and to uh, Europe, to our headquarters, which obviously uh, I have to do every quarter minimum or more, depending on the on, on the needs. So. So mm-hmm. that's where um, uh, my role is. And I've been with this company now for nearly seven years. That's awesome. So for your fabrics, um, are you able to customize them or are designers able to customize them? Or when you send them and um, sell them to pr- product companies, are they printing on them? Yeah, so customization will have multiple meanings. One is on the usage side. So on the UC side, one customization we would say is related to the design. So, you know, somebody wanting to make a very nice dome or a very unique design of the stadium or anything, you know, when you look at uh, Expos, you look at World Cups and other events, every time you see a new stadium or a new design being made. So that's one element where the customization comes from the design and the fabric being in itself being a free flowing material you are able to play on the imagination uh, which an architect or designer wants. Second level of customization, as you just mentioned, could be related to, I have a standard product, can I print on it? Can I design on it? Yes, you can do that, but it depends on which product. Mm -hmm. Um, um, There's a third element of customization could be specific colors. So that we could do depending again on the product and the uh, MOQ because uh, we cannot do it for smaller quantities. So when there are projects which are requiring specific colors or design, we are able to do so. In fact, interestingly, uh, we did one very big stadium where we actually started from the yarns. They wanted a design which was related to a kind of a Bedouin tent uh, in Middle East. So we actually, instead of kind of painting or, um, or coating, we actually started with the yarns itself with those colors and the yarns were woven in that pattern which actually uh, gives that uh, gives that look. So, so there are multiple levels of customization, and then it also depends on the application and the design. So, because the fabric is free flowing, by nature of it, you can customize a lot. But then you have to be careful that whether you compromise on the characteristics or the functionality functionality of the of the material, yeah. or you're able to retain that while at the same time you're able to give what the final client or the architect is looking for. Yeah, that, I mean, that makes sense. So when it comes to, I mean, here in the States, our lead times for all products right now is insane. Um, are you guys going through that same exact thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, US is a big market for us, actually. Uh, we operate in, again, multiple segments. We've done stadiums, airports. We are quite strong in marine and, uh, and furniture applications. Okay. Also, we work with some of the top uh, blind and awning companies, you know, the outdoor eating outdoor sitting is growing very fast in us now so so the big kind of pergolas you can do Uh, the key element as i mentioned to you is is because we are a b2b company Mm -hmm. we don't do all that in that sense ourselves so we will work with the partners so if you are in blinds you will work we will sell our material to a blind manufacturer if we are in tensile structures or pergolas you will work with those companies which have the necessary tools, software, team, and also the necessary, uh, you know, accessories to be able to do those structures or the or, or those designs. Same thing in furniture and marine, you will sell to marine trimmers or furniture manufacturers who are then able to sell either to the retailers of furniture as single mom and pop stores or also to the chain of uh, retailers. So, so in that sense, um, yes, uh, we have to work with always Many architects, many designers also look at uh, the way the industry is evolving. So that's where our R&D comes into uh, focus, where they're able to, you know, see the future, where the industry is moving. Uh, you know, sometimes um, people want 
uh, no PVC. Sometimes people want a certain product. Sometimes they want high level of non-combustibility. So depending on um, necessary needs, we are able to you know go back to our R&D and develop those products, and that's why we are able to maintain that uh, leadership position also in the industry. That's awesome. So my next series of questions I want to ask on the followers that have a national following. I, I haven't had a guest that sells a product like you guys that are national. It's usually just you're just in the United States or just in Australia or whatever country they're in. Um, the first question I want to ask you, how do you and you your per particular territory is multiple different languages. Do, yes. Does that interfere with business at all not having that like that language barrier being there um i would say i mean it's uh, it's yes and no so uh, the good thing about our organization is that the fact um, that we are in multiple segments and have a footprint in many countries mm -hmm. it's also because that we have um, local teams in most of the countries now it depends on the size of the business we may have one person in one country, for example, if I take Egypt, we have one salesperson or Qatar or, or um, say in other parts of the world in Korea. But if I go to the bigger countries where the business is big, uh, whether I look at in Asia, whether Middle East, India, Japan, China, Southeast Asia or Australia, or if I go in Europe, we'll have multiple um, uh, teams on the ground. So, so what it does is then it makes it easy for us to approach the local um, uh, customers and the local um, uh, teams, I mean, or the local influencers or stakeholders. But having said that, yes, I mean, if there are markets where uh, it's still an export market, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it may become a challenge, but you know, we are in that product range where one of the advantages um, we have is that this is not an easy product to be manufactured locally by any local players. Mm -hmm. You need to have a certain level of competence and skill and knowledge and R&D to be able to develop that product. Anybody can talk about textiles, but, you know, but uh, textiles start from a tarpaulin, which you can get for a dollar a square meter or, or a dollar a linear meter, for example, compared to um, something which may sell at $10 or $20, for example. So mm -hmm. now as you go on the complexity of application or the importance of the application and the usage, you cannot use a tarpaulin kind of product to be uh, to be using for blinds or for a structure which you want to stay for 25 years 30 years a stadium for that matter or any other thing so so what happens is that in the end the people who enter in this business say a blind manufacturer a furniture manufacturer or a, a fabricator which is in related to big structures they generally are aware uh, that and they speak uh, a common language which is english so they are able to communicate anyway, and it's easy, it makes it easy. So we are not in like very basic building material where you will always find a local manufacturing uh, firm or this, that language becomes a barrier. So I would not yeah. say language is not a barrier. The barrier is more about the technical skills, whether the uh, customers and the companies which are there in all these countries capable to handle a product like that and that's where our role comes our local people uh, role comes where we are able to work with them we train them we also give them access to different machineries if they need to be able to do complex structures there's a software there's a training needed for that software so all those things we find ways to work with our clients and customers to support them so that they can grow in their skill set and as such they can also you know do business which in the end also helps us to grow our business yeah it does help that you have salespeople in those particular areas. Because my next question was, um, does business practices change per country that you go to? Like the practices of um, how the process of a sale works or um, how to go about a sale, cold calling and all that stuff. Um, it changes per country. I know it changes just in like counties here in the United States. Um, so I'm guessing it, per country, it's probably different as well. It is different. It is different. Um, uh, but at the same time, there's a, also a commonality which exists in this uh, business. So for sure, it's different in the way decisions on big projects are taken. Who are the key stakeholders which are involved? Say if you take a commercial building, if you take a residential building, or if you look at a big structure, as I said, either a stadium or an airport or a railway station or anything you have to build. So depending on 
uh, the decision making that varies by country to country. Um, the people who are involved that also varies by country to country. Sometimes the design comes from local architects. Sometimes the design comes from international architects who, who have uh, multiple offices also in various countries. So, so this is all that we've accumulated as knowledge and skill and expertise um, for us because doing this and approaching and working with different stakeholders is also key to our future. You know, mm -hmm. for example, um, the Olympics are going to happen um, in uh, in US. I think in uh, eight years time, right? Yeah. So the work uh, on that will start in a couple of years time that, okay, what stadiums you have to build, what stadiums you have to bring down or renovate. Now, uh, it's not it's not going to be the last two years. It's going to be the last six, seven years where the work starts. So the moment thing information starts coming out, our local teams on the ground will start approaching that ministry, that department or that county for that matter or uh, architects. Again, it would depend, as I said, in US, the system could be different than in China, than in India, or for that matter, in, in France or in, um, or in Europe. So, so that, may, uh, that is obviously a key element. And the second part is also the distribution or the go-to-market um, uh, elements which exist. You know, some countries you need to work with an importer or a distributor to get your product to the, to the right B2B customers. In some countries, you can directly sell them. So it's an it's an invoice or a, uh, invoicing done from Europe directly to a customer in X Y Z country. They import it, they do the clearances, and then they uh, they use the product to sell the final uh, you know installation. It is, is either an installation or a blind or a furniture item uh, which they do. So that obviously varies, and this is where mm -hmm. having a ground knowledge sometimes helps us that which. Uh, market entry or go to market approach we want to we want to use yeah and i bet so since the pandemic happened and a lot of these zoom calls have been going on and these calls has this helped your business tremendously like being able to just send the drop of an eye just getting on a call um actually i would say differently um okay. why having people on the ground helped us to tide the wave of covid because while people were not able to cross borders but at least people within the country were able to move around you know so that that helped us compared to other companies um i would also say that sometimes it's not easy uh, to get um, people on zoom because everybody's trying to get their time you know i mean whether it's an architect or or a designer or even uh, even sometimes people who are actually in the businesses so with architects and designers by default yes um, they were more uh, I mean, obviously you had to uh, work around their calendar, but it was sometimes easier to have them because um, that's the way they, they had their approach and still have some of the offices still have uh, for precaution reasons uh, that they prefer and they feel it's much more good for them rather than, you know, having people walk in and whatever. But uh, when you look at the our B2B customers, our direct um, customers or partners who buy our product, for them, it's um, I would say it's not so easy because first of all, it's about being comfortable with this uh, media of communication. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, they are so operational that they may be, we may be talking like this, suddenly a call comes, they need to sort out a, a, a issue on the workshop floor or somebody is asking something. So so it is. it has been both ways, actually. It has been both yeah. ways. Yes, we found our way around it. Uh, uh, projects have still come up. Okay, there was a delay, but uh, specification and... Um, uh, working on future projects has still been happening. Yes, and we were able to reach out to them. But in the end, um, more and more now prefer because, you know, in our industry, there's an element of touch and feel of the fabric also. So yeah. you need to feel that, you need to touch that. So even if we do that, sometimes when they ask for samples, we had to arrange to deliver it at the reception, which they got it. So um, that element still remains. Yes, COVID, mm -hmm. um, I mean, 2020 was bad for everyone. But yeah. the last few years have been good and work has still happening. And we are back to now being able to see most of them face to face um, yeah. on, on a regular basis. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And here in the US, I don't know if it's the same over there. A lot of us are working from home still because companies just change. Um, and a lot of people don't want to meet anymore. They went through two years of not meeting. Um, and in sales, it's hard to sell a job when you're not seeing someone face to face. And like you said, your product is so tactile, you need to be able to touch it. 
Cool. How are you hurt, jumping over those hurdles and being able to, you know, schedule meetings in front of architects, designers that necessarily don't want to, they just really would rather go on zoom or just have you send you the product. Well, then we have to come, I mean, work around that, meaning obviously we, we talk to them about uh, the product. So we do that presentation through Zoom or uh, PowerPoint and everything. And at the same time, then we also try to insist and request that a sample can be sent over. So this is happening. Sometimes then uh, after that, they, they would like to have a bigger sample or they really would like to meet somebody because they want to go in further details. Then uh, we are happy to meet. So. Obviously, you cannot force anyone to say, I want to meet you and you have to meet me. Uh, but as long as they are available to have a chat or understand and, uh, you know, uh, give us time for us to be ex explaining to them, uh, it's, uh, it's, um, it's important because uh, let's also not forget that when they are working on big projects, when I'm looking at, say, a commercial building uh, where thousands of blinds have to be done or a very big structure, you have to make like a stadium or an airport. And if the architect is actually thinking that I need to use a composite material or a technical fabric, then they know that they will have to meet because mm -hmm. there's no way around that because the whole element of the whole structure is fabric. So at some point of time, uh, you have to do that. Yes, the big firms generally are already technically competent. They are already aware about the product and everything, but sometimes uh, they may come back to you. You know, I'm thinking of this thing. Is there something you have? Then you talk to them about that and then they say okay yeah maybe uh, uh, okay if it's possible to meet up we we will more than ha be happy to meet up but uh, i won't uh, if if it's related to whether it's a um, deterrent i would say not i mean people have found their ways because in the end let's not also forget those companies they also have to work when yeah. when an architect has to design they whatever they are building no matter whichever material they do they have to still use material so mm -hmm. and and in that sense, they still have to talk to the companies which are which are providing different kinds of material. I'm not only talking about fabrics. So tomorrow it could be cement, it could be any other material which they uh, which they need to use. So if it's classical one, they know okay, it's uh, they understand. But if it's a different one and a unique one, and that's where uh, the membranes and the fabrics offer that possibility to an architect to you know to reimagine things. To, to really work on their imagination and convert that imagination into reality. Now, in that sense, at some point of time, they also want to touch and feel. So, so yes, it does, at some point of time, gives us an opportunity. And um, I, am, I am seeing across the world, more and more people are also coming for conferences and events. We've done so many already this year. I was in Japan 10 days back, which is one of the still a, mark, a country which is um, still slow in opening up. Now they're opening up. But even we had 200 or 250 plus people coming for that facades conference. And it was amazing to interact and everything. Yes, we were wearing masks, but beyond that, the interaction was very, uh, very open. So so I, I think it will be a mix, but um, uh, people will find the way because both sides need, need each other. It's not only uh, it's a hard sell that I have a product you buy. Architects mm -hmm. and uh, the designers, consultants, they are not buying the product. They are trying to understand the product to put it in their design. It's yeah. the, the final client is the one who's for them, they are going to present. So for them, unless they understand better and know the pluses and minuses, how it fits into the design, they also will not be able to give a compelling story to their final client who's who's asked them to work with them on, on that project. So I think there will be a way around it and, um, and things will be... Uh, uh, moving yes again country to country it's as plus and minus you know mm -hmm. in that sense yeah very cool yeah so i want to finish off on a piece of advice you could give to someone who is trying to grow their business outside of their you know hometown or their country um where do they go to start off do you have any advice on just getting the word out or marketing or anything on getting their company up and going outside of their hometown? Well, I think it all starts, the first basic is to know the market. That's very critical, you know, whether it's your next state, whether it's your uh, neighboring country or a country very far off, you will not be able to define the right approach unless you really know what is the market there. 
Mm-hmm. It could be similar product, equivalent product, or a replacement product, for example. I mean, I'm, it could be any business here. I'm not talking about membranes here. And only then when you understand, then the classical piece of marketing always hold. You need to know the distribution channel or the players who exist in that uh, industry or in your product category and everything. And thereafter, then it's uh, it's once you have that, then it makes it easy. Sometimes we just try to directly say, I want to export. And whoever we find the first one, we try to say, okay, yeah, let's do that. But in the end, let's not forget in many of these countries, once you tag with one uh, player or one company, you may not realize that uh, maybe it it uh, it was a short term decision, but in the long term, it's, um, it's um, you know, it's not was the right one. So I would rather say either take a year I mean, depending on the timing, it could be six months, year or two years to do that homework and then start properly rather than rushing for that extra hundred thousand or or extra business, which you can get immediately. But then you will realize after two years that you're not at all growing because your market entry approach was not correct. We've we've learned it the hard way. I've learned it the hard way in my last 15, 20 years, uh, opening up markets, opening up subsidiaries, creating legal entities. We've also made, I've also made mistakes and we, we learn through that, that sometimes in a rush to get immediate business, you do that, but then you realize this partner was not the right one or this approach was not the right one. So, so I think really it starts from the basics, know the market, know the business, which anyway, you know, in your hometown or your home state, but using that knowledge, try to understand the market in the other country or the other state. Then after that, it won't be difficult. Uh, after that, it won't be difficult. Then obviously it's it's um, pricing, all those things which classically will be there. How do you position? What's the cost for that uh, company who imports your product and everything? That's the classical way. But once you know it, then you're able to shape everything accordingly. If you don't know it, then you're at the mercy of the person who's feeding you information on the ground, but you have no idea whether that's the right one or not, not the right one. So. Absolutely. Well, great advice, Nin. And I think that's something that a lot of people struggle with. Um, you know, you, you cap out in your hometown and you kind of want to branch out and make more money, but you don't really know where to start. So that's awesome advice you'd given. Um, I want to end with where anybody um, listening could find your companies, um, maybe their website, um, social hashtags, or where they could find you. So we can, uh, uh, so our website is uh, uh, www.searchferrari.com, S-E-R-G-E and Ferrari for Ferrari, uh, dot com continuous. Or you can find us on LinkedIn uh, with the same name or on Facebook. You can find me on LinkedIn with my name, Nitin Govilla, and you can, uh, somebody can connect with me, with me there uh, if they want to know more about this business or this product or the company. Awesome. Thank you so much, Nitin. Um, Hope you enjoy the rest of your day. And I'm glad we were able to schedule this and um, record this. Yeah. Thank you, Eric. Thank you for having me over. I know it's been a little bit pushed, uh, kept on pushing, but being in different time zones, 12 or 14 hours away, sometimes it's not so easy. I thank you for your patience. And, um, and, um, but it was great to speak with you. Totally understand. It was well worth it.